I'm gonna make you. Okay. And right. as I see, I'm gonna give you the host control, so you'll have the main the the storm and. Right, let me go check the participants. I think we got oh, some minutes. Brenda Rodriguez is Miss Brenda. Yeah. yeah. Hi, Miss Brenda. There she is. So there's one, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four. Okay, good. So we are good to go. It's 5.59, I'll start at six. Um, and so from now on, you can do the admitting. I forgot you were gonna do it, uh, Miss Lizette. So. How are you, Miss Isidra? Ooh. We, we had our vacation last week, so this was our first day back, and we went in person today to the center. So um, it's great to see. No way. Yeah. That's awesome. All right, so it's six o'clock, and we are here live at the uh, Parent Parent Power Group here at the Al Wooten Junior Youth Center, and uh, we have Miss Alberta Moore and Miss Brenda Rodriguez. And we hope other parents will join us. That's my son you know, doing my parent thing. All right, see you later, have fun. Um, I'm a parent, I'm a Cedric person Lynn. I'm the ELA lead here at, and that's the English Language Arts here at the Wooten Center. I have five sons, the youngest is 38, who just walked out. But uh, then we have the grands coming through. And so this parent, this parent power group is for all of us, those of us who have children and those who don't because they may get them one day. So tonight we're gonna to get our hands dirty. Tonight we are going to talk about gardening basics. I don't think we're gonna actually get them dirty tonight, but Miss Nicole Steele has done it many times and I cannot wait for you to see these wonderful, powerful images that she has about things we can do. She's with the Social Justice Learning Institute and uh, take it away, Miss Nicole, wait. Did you send? Okay, if you didn't, I will do it on uh, later on. If you, because I, I don't yeah. see one, but um, uh, yeah. So, Miss Nicole Steele, please, as a parent, join us here at Al Wooten. Welcome, welcome, and let us know what we need to know about gardening. Awesome, thank you, Miss Isija. It's wonderful to be here with you all. Thank you for having me. Like she said, my name is Nicole. I'm over here in Inglewood, California, and I'm growing food in my community. Um, before I get started though, I would love it if uh, anyone, whether it be Miss Isidra or Miss Lizette or any of the parents here, tell me a little bit about the Wooten Center and your relationship with it, um, just cause I'd like to know more. That way we know each other and then I'll tell you more about myself and we can keep going. Okay, so one of the parents can take it away. You're all very, um, I think most of you are people who've been with us, but the Wooten Center is a youth center, just to let you know that part of the background. And um, Al Wooten Jr. was uh, Miss Naomi uh, McSwain, our executive director, that was her cousin. He was killed in a drive-by uh, 31 years ago, I think it is. And that's how long the center's been around. His mother, Faye Rump, decided she wanted to do something for the other youth so they don't have to go around looking for you know, people to kill. He wasn't a, a youth youth. I think he was in his 30s when this happened. So all this work, all this stuff that you know we do with students from third to 12th grade and beyond, um, we've been doing so that these young people can be directed to where they want to go. A lot of college. Um, programs that we do. We do tutoring, free tutoring. We do, um, oh, there's so many things. The summer camp is starting. The basketball camp's going on now. It's, there's just a lot. Miss Brenda, Miss Alberta, Miss Crystal, would you like to fill Miss Nicole in on your experience here at the Wooten Center? Don't be shy. Just open up the mic. 
And if not, it's okay. I appreciate that explanation, Miss Aishidra. Okay. And, and you can also use the chat function too if you want to put it in the chat. If you feel more comfortable putting it in there, um, that's cool as well. But thank you for letting me know about that. I'm really honored to be um, here with you all today. Uh oh. We were Miss Tracy Thomas. Hi, Miss Thomas. Uh, excited to be with you here all today. We're going to talk about something that we can do um, for ourselves that, in my opinion, is a very revolutionary act. Um, I got into gardening because I live in a city that has a whole lot of people that look like me, um, that are black and brown, and we don't have access easily to healthy food. It's just, that's just how it is. And in communities that I go up into across the country, I'm, I'm from Baltimore on the East Coast, it looks the same way. And when I talk to my friends and my family across the country, they deal with the same issues. So instead of waiting for somebody to come in and say, oh, well, they deserve a Trader Joe's, they deserve a Whole Foods, they deserve a Ralph's Fresh Fair, as opposed to the regular Ralph's, right? We can grow food together and share it with each other and teach our children a legacy that really means something to us. Um, and with this kind of resurgence of interest across the country in Juneteenth, I really think that this is a fitting um, way to get together today. So we're going to talk about some of the really just kind of basic level things of gardening, what you can do at home if you're trying to start a garden or if you have a garden. Please feel free to ask me questions. Put your own tips in the chat or you know raise your hand we can make this interactive if you garden i'd love to hear your experiences um so i'm going to go ahead and share my screen so we can get started back to the end to the beginning all right so we're gonna start off with my 10 simple rules for gardening gardening doesn't have to be difficult it can be something that's incredibly fulfilling. It can be something that easily fits into your life. We just have to learn how to be kind of honest with ourselves and our situation uh, so that we can do the best for ourselves and for our family, not make it something stressful. So just kind of 10 simple things and we'll get into these in even more detail as we go through. Plan your garden before you can begin and only plant as large of a garden as you can manage. I know when I first started, I'm not even going front, I was like, yes, I'm so excited. And I started huge and I was not ready to start huge. <laughs> I should have started small so that I could really learn what I was doing, get a handle on it and then grow from there because you can always grow from you know, a smaller space to a larger space. Um, so yeah, just being realistic about that. Um, start small, plan, and we'll talk about that so that you can do really well for yourself. Um, it's better to have a small productive garden than a large neglected one. Remember that besides harvesting your vegetables, you do have to weed and water and control pests to a certain extent. Grow crops that produce the most food in the space available, right? So think about a watermelon. If you're not familiar with a watermelon plant, it gets gigantic. The leaves are big, the fruit is big, the vine is very wild and crazy. If you only have a space that you know might not be conducive to something taking up all that space, then maybe we could think about other things we could do. Plant vegetables that are rich in nutrients, right? We wanna get the most bang for our buck. We want our communities to be full of people that are fed well and fed with nutritious food because we run into so much food like fast food and things that are not nutrient dense all the time. So think about you know, those types of things. Plant during the correct season for the vegetable you wanna grow. Luckily out here in Los Angeles, we have a very, very forgiving climate. So you can try things all year round. We'll talk about that a little bit more. Don't limit your garden, right? We just talked about that. We live in LA, so we can do kind of all kinds of things. We're gonna talk about sun requirements. Most vegetables require about eight full hours of sun a day. So we have to be mindful about what that looks like in the space that we're gonna be using. Prepare the soil properly and we'll get into the nitty gritty of that, pun intended, and water and fertilize as needed. So we'll talk about that too. So those are just kind of 10 like quick and fast things that you can think about as we go into this. And again, if you have any questions, I'll try to pull up the chat so we can see um, what's going on here. All right, so next, the benefits of gardening. This is something that 
sometimes gets overlooked when we think about kind of the functionality of gardening, but it's just something that's so, such a beautiful thing to um, participate in. It really is exercise. It really is exercise. Studies show, and I, I wear my Fitbit or like a, a fitness tracker in the garden sometimes to see kind of what I'm up to. You can burn as many calories in 45 minutes of gardening as you can in 30 minutes of aerobics. So there are times when I'm out there with a pickaxe and I am going for it or a shovel or you're lifting things or you're bending and squatting and twisting and things like that. So you really are using your muscle groups. You're doing cardio. Sometimes the way you have to step over and step through things, you're working on your balance. So, you know, you can really think about it as something that you're pouring into your body. We know that for adults, we need at least 30 minutes of physical activity a day in order to just stay healthy and reduce the risk of chronic diseases. And gardening is a really wonderful way to do that. Gardening is a great stress reducer. There is something so unspoken and magical about putting your hands in the soil. And I don't know how to quantify it, right? There are scientists that are trying to kind of figure out what exactly it is, but we know, you know, it's kind of this, you know, whatever you believe in, it's kind of this divinity when you connect with the earth. And we see it, especially when we take our children out into the garden, when I teach at schools, you would imagine that children, when you get them outside, would be running and jumping and doing all those joyful things that children do. But there's something about focusing their attention in the garden and getting their hands in the soil and taking in the sun all at the same time that just really makes them focused and calm and connected. And I think that that's such a beautiful thing. So um, it's a great way to reduce stress and connect with the earth, connect with your ancestors. Um, so gardening has a, that benefit as well. And then you know where your food comes from. You know, we don't always know exactly where our food comes from, whose hands have touched it, what's been in it. And while we give thanks for the, the workers that, that harvest our food and bring our food to us, there is something very wonderful and powerful about being able to say, I know where this came from. I know my neighbor grew that. I know I grew this for my neighbor. Um, so that's really kind of a wonderful thing as well. I want us to be creative. These are kind of my three mantras when, um, let me just pop up my screen. These are kind of my three mantras when I talk about gardening. Um, be creative, choose plants wisely. You can find space to garden anywhere and know your area. You're gonna hear me say that throughout this presentation a lot. And it's not as daunting as it sounds, but it's something, it's this practice of becoming familiar with the space where you wanna grow food in, right? So if you look at these pictures, of course, there's the traditional way of gardening right in the ground, which is wonderful and what this earth was made for. There's raised beds, which some people find to be much more um, like compact and neat if they're looking for a certain look or if it's better to use that for the soil. Like this person has grass that might be better for them because grass is invasive and it will always be in your garden if it's in the ground. And then containers, right? I love this bathtub. I've always wanted to do that. One day when I own a home and I have space, I'm going to find me an old bathtub and I'm gonna grow food in it. Cause I've always thought that that was so wonderful. We've got tomatoes here growing just, you know, in a nice little plastic pot on the patio. And then um, these little uh, tin can lettuce um, cups, which are really great. That's in someone's kitchen window. So you really can garden anywhere with a little bit of, you know, tinkering around and creativity. It's a really awesome practice um, and getting your kids involved, you know, asking them, where do you think you could garden at? Do you think that this pot could fit on the patio? Oh, what about this bucket I've had in the shed for a long time? Let's see if we can use that. There's all these wonderful different ways in which you can garden. All right, know your area. Know your area. When I say that, that means that you have to do some planning before you get to planting your food. So what I generally do with friends that I'm helping to garden or people that I'm helping to garden is I ask them to take about a week before we start actually planting and just observe the space. Same way you would do if you were studying something or learning something new. You are taking observation of what you see outside. So when it comes to sunlight, knowing your area. How many areas of the sun does your potential garden get? What, um, what shade do you see? Do you ever see a spot where, oh, in the middle of the day, I noticed that this one swath of, of land is shaded, but everything else is sunny. 
Plants need at least six to eight hours of sunlight a day. And luckily out here in LA, we get some nice, bright, beautiful sunlight. Um, so they're in good company, um, so they will be fine. Root and leafy crops can tolerate some shade. So things like lettuce, spinach, kale, collard greens, carrots, beets, those things, they are focused more on leaves and roots, so they don't need as much sun. But when you think about things like tomatoes or squash, um, cucumbers, things that have some type of a fruit or they produce some type of above ground like piece that we're going to harvest and eat, those are the things that are going to need about six to eight hours of sun a day. I have found in my experience that six hours of sun does very well. Six hours of sun is usually good, but if you can get that eight, that's always awesome. Um, and then with my, my leafy crops, especially with lettuce and things like that, uh, sometimes I'll plant them underneath of my taller plants so that they're getting shade while my taller plants, like my tomatoes or my corn, is soaking up all of the sun. So those are options that we can use as well. Um, avoid planting on the shady side of buildings. So again, this comes with knowing your area. Are you in a space where the sun is coming from east to west and right around noon, it hits the top of the building and so it shades that space of the garden? Um, and then like we just talked about, you can plant taller plants to the north and shorter of the shorter plants so that you're avoiding shading everything all at once. Do we have any questions so far about sunlight? Oh, we have someone that is starting a garden. Yes, the kids are enjoying the process except for the toiling. And I totally understand that, but that's one of those lessons, right? You toil now and you, you reap the rewards later. So I hope that they are, you know, learning that lesson while they go. Uh, but yeah, sunlight is something that we need. You know, we need vitamin D throughout the day and that's how we get it through the sun. And plants, one of the things that I find so fascinating about them is that they are the only species of, of living thing on this earth that can create their own food. So, you know, we have to ingest other things in order to get our nutrients, our fiber, our, our protein. But plants can just stand in the sun, put their leaves out and create, you know, use that energy to create nourishment for themselves. And I just think that that's so amazing. I, I know that's really nerdy of me, but um, mm -hmm. yeah, making sure they get good sunlight is good. Do we have a question? Nope, all right, let's move on. Soil. Soil can be a little bit of a mystery, right? We see it, it's brown, it does something, it's a medium that the plant is in, but what does it really mean? So as you can see from this definition, soil is a mixture of broken rocks and minerals, living organisms and decaying organic matter. It also includes air and water. So I have a little breakdown here with this pie chart. When I think about soil, I think about the beginning of time. Right, These rocks and these minerals in the soil have been here since this earth was forged. However, we believe that it got here. And so to be able to work with that and to grow food with that and for it to be perfectly created so that it nourishes the plants on this earth, right? And holds us up and holds organisms. I just always think that that's something that's so beautiful. So understanding how it works is really wonderful and knowing that oftentimes when our plants are not doing well, it's not necessarily a problem with the plant. Oftentimes it's a problem with the soil. So I encourage people to learn to care for your soil. And we're gonna talk about knowing our area again in a minute, but if you take care of the soil, the soil will take care of your plant and then your plant will take care of you. So understanding, you know, there are these minerals like phosphorus and uh, sodium a little bit of and things like that that are in the soil and that's what helps to make up the constitutions of our plants. There's organic matter like decaying other plants, decaying leaves and things like that. And then the porous space in between is that air and that water. So when we're planting, we want to look for something called loam and I'll show you a good picture of it and show you how you can see what kind of soil you have in your garden. But again, know your area. What kind of soil do you have? So we know what sand looks like. You go to the beach, you see sand, you can hold it in your hand. And if you open your fingers, it all just comes running through, right? You know what clay looks like. Think about Play-Doh or a pottery wheel. It is compact, it is hard. If you squeeze it into a ball, it stays 
formed like that. But what we want is something kind of in the middle is called loam, which is kind of equal-ish parts of sand, silt, and clay. So loam looks like this loamy one in the middle. You can see the sand and you can see the clay. So one of the things you can look for, you can go out and like soak your soil. Soak the soil, of course, before you're planting while you're doing that observation. If the water just drains right through, right? You're watering it and the water just goes right on down. It takes less than maybe about a minute and a half. You probably have sandy soil. The particles are large, so the water can just fall right down to the bottom. That's not necessarily good because it makes it so that the roots don't have enough time to be moisturized in that water. If you have clay soil, that water is just gonna sit right on top for quite some time. Um, it's gonna be very difficult for it to kind of penetrate the soil because it's so hard. Those particles are so small and compacted together that water can't get down. If you have loam, that soil is kind of the perfect mixture of all of those so that that water can get through not so fast and not so slow and your roots have enough time to be moisturized and it the, the soil holds the water in a way that allows it to expand in a good area so that your roots can really expand themselves and go out exploring um, and again, stay moisturized and get it. So silt is, okay, if, oh, I went for it. Silt is like dust almost. If you think about like, if you go out into your garden and it's like hard and you hit it with the shovel and some dust flies up, that's silt. But sometimes we'll get into a, a soil that is all silt. It's like dirt sand, if that makes any sense. I don't know, that's the best way I can explain it, like a sandy dirt. Um, so the particles are still pretty large, but they're very, very soft. Whereas, you know, sand particles, if you rub them in your fingers, they're hard, they're kind of crystallized. Silt is like just super dusty, if that makes sense. Um, so yeah, understanding, well, what kind of soil do I have here? Um, another way you can test is the water test. So you, again, you water that area, you pick up your soil and you squeeze it. If it's sandy, again, it's gonna run through your fingers. If it's clay, it's just gonna form kind of a clump. And that clump is not gonna break apart easily. If it's loam, however, it'll be kind of spongy and it might form a clump, right? It'll form a clump in your hand, but if you open your hand, it easily kind of breaks apart into larger pieces. So we want that loam. Now, here's the thing. There's a lot of sand and a lot of clay in LA. <laughs> There's a lot of it. So we have to figure out, well, how do I get my garden and, or, or my soil in a space? Um, oh, we got somebody telling me about the Wooten Center. I'm gonna come back to this. How do I get my soil in a space where it's ready for, for plants? It's ready for roots and, and things and, and worms to be able to get through and you know all that activity to happen. Well, there's composting. I will be honest with you. I am not an expert on composting, but I'm gonna tell you a little bit of the basics and then I'm gonna tell you where you can find more information if that's something that you're interested in. So compost is basically organic matter. You can add, again, this is just so phenomenal about the earth <laughs> and how it works. You can add decaying organic matter to your soil and it will fix it. It'll fix it. Um, if you have a large space, you're going to need a lot of a lot of it. If you have just a little space, you probably won't need so much. So again, that's something that you want to think about as you're planning for your garden. Well, should I start with maybe like a two by two because trying to get my hands on compost might be a little difficult or maybe even a little expensive right now. But if I start here, then I can you know work up to something else. Should I start in pots so I can just buy healthy soil? Um, was there a garage or a building or a structure on this soil recently, which means that there might be contaminants in the soil, so maybe I shouldn't put anything right there. Those are all things that you think about as you come to know your space um, so that you can garden properly. Composting sounds difficult. It sounds difficult. It does take a little bit of something, but it's not as hard as you think, right? So basically what it is, it's a mixture of nitrogen, um, and then green waste. So your browns, things like um, cardboard or non-glossy paper, so your newspaper um, or printer paper, um, not magazines though, that glossy paper doesn't work. 
leaves, the leaves that fall from a tree, but are brown that are not, not so alive. And, you know, if they fall from a tree, they turn brown pretty quickly. Um, woody material. So you can think like mulch, things like that. Those are your browns. Your greens are exactly what they are, things that are green. So food scraps, grass clippings, um, anything that kind of was recent, is recently alive and still decaying. So banana peels and apple cores and manure, things like that. You put those together and they have to, they go through this process because the nitrogen is helping to break down the carbon and the green stuff and they heat up and you have to have moisture. Like it's a whole little science experiment in and of itself, but those things heat up together and then the organisms start to get in there and eat away and break down and cause all of these processes to happen. And out of that comes your compost. And it is just a really great way to help to turn over your soil. So if you have soil that's not so good, if you add compost, it will fix it up. It will fix it up. So these are some things that you can put in compost, like we were talking about, cardboard, tea bags, eggshells. Eggshells are a great, uh, acid adding um, component of compost, egg cartons that are paper, not cardboard, um, not styrofoam. Um, carrot, you know, food scraps like we talked about, you wanna avoid anything that has sauce on it. So, you know, if you happen to make some really great vegetables, but you put like a rich buttercream sauce, that's probably not your best bet. But if you use like balsamic vinegar, that's okay because you know, that's a, a natural kind of organic thing. And then you can look here, these are things you want to keep out of it. Meats, bones, glass, cheese, <laughs> like we talked about anything with um, sauce. You want to stay away from like kitty manure or dog manure. The only kind of manure that I use is chicken or horse manure, um, but that's advanced composting. You don't have to use manure at all. Um, and then some people say to keep weeds out of your compost because they will proliferate. And it's true. If you put dandelions in your compost, um, you will get lots more dandelions. So again, something you just have to consider, is that something that you want to do? She's right. So Tracy is saying bananas, coffee grounds, and eggs are really good for gardens, but you have to know which fruits and veggies to put in. Thank you for that, Tracy. She's absolutely right. Um, I like to use peels. I like to use, I like to use all, all my vegetables. One of the things you want to do if you're starting to, if you're starting a compost pile, how, that's a great question. How long does it take to become compost? If you're starting a compost pile, you want to, like, say you have like a rotting watermelon. You can't just toss the watermelon down, put some stuff on it, and then it's going to become compost. You want to break it up, right? The smaller you can break things up, the better for those, um, those processes to happen that heat them up and allow the microorganisms to come and break them apart. Um, you can think about it like digestion. We have to chew our food first before it can go through our body and our body can process it. Same with your compost. If you can chop it up, break it up, um, break it down, that's better for it. How long does it take to become compost? That varies on how much work you're willing to do. <laughs> <laughs> if you are somebody that's going to be regularly moisturizing and turning your compost, whether it's in a turning bin or just with a shovel, if you have a pile and you're just moving it around, it'll compost much faster than if you just create a compost pile and let it be. And it is done both ways in many different places, um, but it just kind of depends on how big the pile is or how big your composting operation is and how much work you put into it. At the quickest, I would say you can get some really good compost in like two months. Um, that's what I see where I see like really great hummus, which is loam soil coming out. Um, so yeah, it's like a long-term process and it's part of sustainability. It's something that I really hope to see more of in the inner city um, and in our communities because it is a phenomenal way to be sustainable. I would love to see it on school campuses because there is just so much food there um, that can be used for that. Um, so yeah, what I would suggest if you're somebody that's really interested in doing composting is to check with your local waste management company, whoever picks up the trash in your city they're going to have a composting program and they have classes. Some even will like send you a compost bin or give you discounts on compost bins. Um, there's also the LA compost dot 
Com, the LA, yeah, LACompost.com. They're an organization that does composting in LA. Um, so yeah, your local waste management or LACompost.com are good resources if you want to like really get into composting. Um, but I hope this gave you kind of a good idea of what that could look like. And thanks for all the questions and comments. That's really helpful. Miss Nicole? Yes. Does it stink? It can. So if you're doing it right, you're not gonna have much odor. If you're doing it right, the way that it processes and breaks down and the, the, the way that you add the, the dry materials in with the wet materials, it, it shouldn't cause any problems. You shouldn't have any rodents. You may have flies like that, but if you're doing it properly, it's gonna break down in a way that it, it doesn't smell. That does take, like I said, like that, that can take a little bit more effort though and work to make sure that that's happening and it's turning regularly or that you're covering it and moisturizing it regularly. Um, but I, I hope I'm not discouraging anybody from composting, but it is something that you have to put a little bit more effort into um, if you want that to be a part of your garden. That's a great question though. <laughs> Um, I went too far forward. All right, so watering. So what I know is that oftentimes when people see that their plants are not looking the way they expect them to, they think that it's a problem with water. And so they go and they water it more, and then that makes the plant suffer even more. So we have to be pretty careful with water. Um, the same way we can be overhydrated, so can our plants and so can our soil. So it's ideal to keep your soil evenly moist, which means that with vegetables, you don't want the soil to ever get to the point where it's dried all the way out. And you don't want the soil to ever get to the point where it's like soaking wet. And I know that it is some people's practice to let the soil dry all the way out and then flood it and then let it dry all the way out and then flood it. Um, but that's not the ideal way that we should be taking care of our plants. Um, we wanna water our plants as close to the soil level as possible and avoid watering the leaves because when the sunlight comes down, it can burn the leaves in those spots where the water is. It acts like little magnifying glasses. And we wanna put similar plants with similar watering needs together. So you don't have a plant that's like, oh, I don't like that much water next to a plant that's like, oh, I need a whole lot of water you could you know, make the condition difficult for either one of them. So with knowing our area, some things to think about before we get started is how often will you be able to water? Are you somebody that should start off with plants that do not need a lot of water because let's face it, we're busy. <laughs> we get up, we get our kids together, we go to work, we go to practice, we go here, we go there. There's a lot on our plates. So will we have the time? And it's okay if you're like, eh, I don't know if I have it right now, so I'm gonna start out with one plant, or I'm gonna start out with rosemary because rosemary don't need a lot of water, or I'm gonna start out with a cactus because I only gotta hit that once, maybe twice a month. That's okay to start there and you know see how you do with that. Um, will you need to install an irrigation system, or do we have the means to install an irrigation system? I have friends that have said, you know, well I have sprinklers, so let's figure out how we can work with the timers on those to make it so that they water my plants properly. And then again, are there areas in your garden where the water pools or where it runs off? So oftentimes people will plant a garden and then realize later that as they're watering, all the water is going down to the right. And so the plants up at the top aren't getting what they need because they're on a slight incline, they didn't realize it, and so all the water is running down. So that's something definitely to consider before you start because it's really helpful in helping how you plan your garden and just, you know, you can make small fixes like putting some extra soil up at the top to level it out or maybe putting some structures or bricks or a box around to help to level out your space. Um, some plants like a lot of water. Those flower, those summer plants like we talked about, the ones that have some type of a fruit like a watermelon or a tomato or a squash, cucumbers, those are water loving plants. And when we eat them, we get all of those, that water that's infused with nutrients and it's wonderful. Um, so those type of plants, it's, it's, a, it's not a game, it's just 
a balancing act, trying to understand how often to water with the changing climate, right? So like last week, I had to water a lot because it was so hot. But this week, things have cooled down a little bit, and I might not need to water as often as I did last week. So also thinking about, well, do I have the time to kind of play that game with my garden? Do I have the time to tap in in that way to recognize or do, you know, are my children or there other people in my house that can help me do that is a really great um, thing to think about before you get started as well. Um, so what I gen a general rule of thumb for myself is if I stick my finger into the soil, my whole finger, and it's dry down here, then I know that I need to water. If I stick my finger in and it comes out, you know, a whole bunch of soil on my finger that's super wet, then I probably need to leave it alone for a couple of days so they can dry out a little bit. But that's my general rule of thumb. If it's if about three inches down, you don't feel any water, or you unearth the soil a bit about three inches down, you don't feel anything, you probably need to water. And it can be tricky because with the, the heat, you can water and then an hour later, that top level of soil looks dry. But it's not necessarily the case because again, when you stick your finger down in there, you may feel some water and that lets you know your plants are okay. What fruits and, oh, no wonder my time died. I'm sorry, Lisette. <laughs> what fruits and veggies do you have to replant to produce more fruits and veggies after the first harvest, which you can leave? I got you. So those I call cut and come again crops, which means you can cut some and come again and they'll keep growing. Things that you can leave in the ground that will keep growing over and over and over. Tomatoes, of course, they produce lots of fruits. Things like squashes, cucumbers, they will continue to produce fruit throughout the season. Lettuce, you don't have to take the whole head. You can just harvest the leaves around the outside and make sure you leave at least three or four leaves on the inside and that will keep growing. Shard is another leafy green that does that. Collard greens. And if you have walking collard greens, the stalk gets super tall and you get to see it grow. And that's really fun. Kale, same way. You take some of the leaves, leave some on, it'll keep growing. Your herbs are the same way. You can just pick the leaves that you need, let it continue to grow. The plants that you have to continue to replant over and over because you, once you harvest it, it's done, are your roots. So carrots, beets, radishes, turnips. Once you pull them out, that's it, they're not gonna take you know, grow anymore because you've taken the whole plant out. Um, something that I'd like to teach more about is seed saving because with all of these plants, even sometimes you've never seen the seed, they all do produce some type of seed or have some type of way to proliferate. Um, so an experiment that I love to do with kids is to leave one plant in the ground to just produce seed and see what it looks like all throughout the process, right? So we grow a carrot because we want the root. But if you leave it in the ground, of course it grows all these beautiful leaves, but it also grows flowers. And then those flowers will grow seeds. Um, so that's something that's really interesting for people to see the flowers on a collard plant and on a lettuce plant. Like we of course never really see that because we just want the leaves off of it, but they're beautiful and they attract so many bees and the seed saving process is so easy. Um, but yeah, those cut and come again, you just harvest from the outside of the leafy plants and let it continue to grow. And then your fruiting plants will keep growing throughout the season. I hope that answered your question. Let's see what's next. Pests and weeds. This is something that really grinds people's gears. The first thing I like to let people know is that pests and weeds are not waking up in the morning like, oh, I'm gonna get on Miss Alberta's nerves to day. Let me see how mad I can make her, right? They're not waking up and saying, you know what, Miss Brenda, I'm coming for you and your stuff because I want it. That's not how that works. They're not purposely trying to frustrate you. They're just living their lives. They were made in the same way that the plants that were trying to harvest are made. And they're just out here like, oh, this is a beautiful, loved on space. And I feel like I'm welcome here even though they're not. <laughs> so we have to find ways to let them know that maybe we can share the space in a more equitable and like constructive way, as opposed to like being extremely frustrated. How to get rid of gophers, <laughs> how to get rid of gophers. Um, we'll talk about that. So before you start gardening, know your area. What weeds do you see already growing there? There probably are some weeds there already if it's a, a, a space that is conducive to growing because weeds have been 
or weeds have grown and evolved to be able to grow in any kind of environment. They're very resilient. So what do you see? What do the weeds look like as seedlings so that you know, oh, this is a weed, I should probably pull it up. What do your weeds look like when they're about to flower, right? We all know what a dandelion looks like when it's ready to let those little wispy seeds go. What do your other weeds look like when they flower? Because that helps us understand it's about to get to the point where it's going to produce babies and I, I might need to pick it, you know, before it does that. Um, while you're gardening, are they, are they causing issues with your vegetables? Are the weeds even doing anything that's, you know, detrimental to what's growing in your garden? They might just be out there hanging out, you know, deterring pests together. And we'll talk about that in a second. And then there are there animals common to your area to consider. So do you have squirrels? Do you have gophers? Do you have raccoons um, that you think might get into your garden? Do you have cats <laughs> that you think might get into your garden and eat them up? When you're learning and exploring your area, when you dig into the soil, do you see grubs or do you see a lot of anthills or, you know, anything like that? Those are things that you want to look for before you get started. So that comes with that knowing of your area. So some of the things that I encourage people to do, I like to garden in an organic way. I don't like to use any type of chemicals or pesticides in my garden. That's not for everybody and that's okay. You do whatever works best for you, but the way that I do it does not include those things. So I'm very hands-on. I pull my weeds out. If you're watering your soil, you know, it's healthy and happy, it should be relatively easy to pull those weeds out with the exception of palms. Um, palm trees, when they drop seed, those, those roots are like, they feel like they're in concrete, but you can get them out. <laughs> you can definitely get them out. And the younger you get them out, the easier. Um, Look for grass. If you had grass in that space before, you're one, going to want to consult with somebody about the best way to remove it permanently because grass will always come back. It always, always comes back. However, if it's not really bothering your vegetables, it's not necessarily something to worry about. Something I think people get conflated with like weed and pest control is a desire for um, beauty or not even, I don't want to call it beauty, but a desire for like neatness. And if you're somebody that's like, I want my garden to look very neat, you know, clean rows, nothing bothering it, then that is something that you're going to have to put a little bit more work into, right? You got to, you, if you want to manicure it, then you have to manicure it. But oftentimes weeds will be in our garden and they're not necessarily doing anything harmful to the plants. So if you can deal with it for a little bit, it's okay. You don't have to weed every single day. You do want to pull your weeds though before they go to seed so that you don't end up with like a dandelion problem, um, things like that. And you will notice that once you start to garden in most gardens, once you really start to nurture that soil, then the weeds just like the plants are very happy. So you have to be mindful not to let them get too happy and start making a whole bunch of weed babies. Um, the best way to deal with gophers and vertebrates, thank you, Miss Isidra. The best way to deal with gophers and vertebrate uh, pests is to find a, a humane person to come and work with them. What I generally do with gophers is wherever, if I spot, see that they're making holes in my garden, I will flood them. So I'll take my hose and I'll fill it up with water, fill it up with water. I might put a little bit of vinegar in there as well, maybe a little bit of cayenne pepper just as an added deterrent. But that shows them like, don't come this way. And I just do that with whatever holes they make until they finally kind of realize like, all right, you know what? I'm not dealing with this no more. And eventually they will go away. When it comes to things like raccoons or possums, those things you need to call somebody. There's not really, a, unless, you know, someone in your household is kind of trained to do that. There's not necessarily a way that I know to humanely deal with those things. Um, but if you can call uh, pest control specialists, if you have things like that, that would be helpful. One thing that is helpful is to keep trash away from your garden. If you have trash cans or dumpsters, um, maybe don't put your garden near that space because raccoons tend to um, gather around places where there's like cooked food and, and, and snacks and sugary things like that. Um, and um, cats. I, in general, will plant a space where there is catnip away from my garden. And that had in the past has helped me get keep cats out of my garden. Cats, I find they don't necessarily bother my garden, especially if the soil is usually moist. Um, they're generally looking for like a litter box. They're not really eating anything in the, in the garden. 
but if your soil is generally moist, they're not coming in. Also, mulch is a good deterrent for cats because they don't like the way it feels on their feet. Um, so that could be a good possibility as well. And then there's things like um, netting that you can get. You can buy just, you know, some easy tool from um, like tool, like tutu material. You could get from a fabric store. Uh, you could buy like gardening tool or garland, gardening netting and chicken wire as well. And you can make some really easy kind of garden covers if you need to go that far. I flushed out two gophers, but they came back. <laughs> Keep flushing them out. That's the best advice that I have for you. That, that's what I, I do. I just keep flushing them out. Um, and then of course, look for spots, gatherings of bugs, signs of distress on your vegetables. If you can catch things early, that's the best way to do it. Um, I like to use insecticidal soap or just dish soap. Neem oil is also a really great way to deter bugs. And um, you know, let big bugs eat little bugs. Spiders, I know they're terrifying. Let them be, they're eating all the stuff you don't want. Um, ladybugs, they are eating all the things we don't want. Um, and then I also like to plant certain vegetables with each other. Marigolds are a great way to deter aphids from your leafy greens. Um, rosemary, thyme, a lot of your herbs are really great ways. And onions, onion chives, um, garlic, those are really great ways. Things that you can just plant disperse throughout your garden to help um, keep pests away from your other ones. At home, I had to use forks and skewers to keep cats and squirrels on America. Like hand-to-hand -hand combat? How did you use these forks and skewers? <laughs> I stuck them down in the dirt so that they don't come, the cats couldn't come around the, the boxes because okay. the skewers were sticking up and the forks were down in the dirt. I planted them down in the dirt. So the squirrels, when they dig, they don't want to feel the, the poking of the forks. That is some creativity right there, and I love it. I really thank you for sharing that. So yes, get creative. Go on and get some some sticks, and just be careful. Um, but that's a really a really great thing. Thank you for that. And that's you know to be honest, that's what our ancestors were doing. They were you know using these different things that they had at their disposal to help keep their gardens um, the ways that they needed them to be. So these are just some common. I'm sorry, were you about to say something? Yeah, I just wanted to ask Miss Lizette. Miss mm -hmm. Lizette, do you usually go to the top of the hour? I oh, think I, I, until oh, 7 p.m. Okay, thanks, Miss Lizette. Go ahead, then I'll start. I thought it was 6.45. That's why I was giving you. The oh, okay. Oh, no. Okay. Um, these are some common um, weeds that you'll see in Los Angeles. Again, the main thing that you wanna be concerned about is grass. If it's there, most likely it's coming back, especially if you're watering and nurturing a garden. So if you've removed it, you need to remove it very, very deep, or you need to use kind of like some heat, um, like heat methods to help kill the rhizomes in that area. Another good option is to put a raised bed on top of the grass and with a base on the bottom or like um, gardening fabric on the bottom so that the grass can't get up in there. But you're probably always gonna be pulling a little bit of grass out of your garden as it grows. Um, this is so whistle and there's a couple different types of grass in, in California, but this is one of the commons when you see. This is so thistle here, burr clover, cut leaf geranium. And of course we have lots of different kinds of dandelions, those palms that I talked about. Um, just be very mindful that Again, those are plants. They're not trying to be annoying to you. They're just trying to live their life and to remove them before they go to seed so that they don't continue to produce more weeds. Another question. Yes, you can put a raised bed over, over your grass um, and put lots of layers of gardening fabric. You can even put some mulch underneath of it to help keep that grass tamped down so that it doesn't bother your garden as much as it would without a barrier there. So yeah, these are some basics. Um, again, know your area. Once you kind of study it and get to know it, it's, an, it's a never ending process. You're gonna be learning about your garden and learning about the soil and learning about the changes over and over and over again. There's all these, different things that you'll be considering once you get started because everything is different but you know your garden once you plant it it works in concert with you 
it becomes this really awesome symbiotic relationship where you're taking care of it and it's taking care of you and it's communicating with you and you're communicating with it. Uh, I literally do talk to my plants, sing to my plants, rap to my plants um, because they enjoy it. And I see the benefits of that when I do it. Enjoy your harvest immensely. What I want to discourage people from thinking is that you're gonna plant this garden and it's gonna completely replace your groceries. Probably not yet. If you're trying to like transform your whole yard into like a mini farm and you have the time and the space for that, then that's when we can start looking at that. And those are solutions that I'm looking at right now as solutions for our community. But in the meantime, just grow some lettuce. You can never have to buy lettuce again, right? You can grow your herbs so that when you make your spaghetti, your kids are going outside and picking those herbs and seeing how that tastes, that freshness tastes when they put in their spaghetti. Grow one tomato plant and learn how to make some bomb spaghetti sauce or some bomb pizza sauce, right? It doesn't have to be the whole world. It just has to be a little bit. But if we're all kind of doing the small things that we can, then we'll be doing a great job. Teach your children, bring them out there, let them see you doing it, let them get their hands dirty, let them get their feet dirty, right? Just allow them to be in that space. It's so transformative and it's something that they really do carry with them as an adult. Even if they don't go on to garden, every adult that I talked to who was fortunate enough to have some type of gardening experience as a child, including me, remembers it. I wasn't a big gardener as a kid, but my grandfather grew a couple of bell peppers and collard greens in the backyard in the summertime. And that stuck with me. The experience of seeing something go from seed all the way to my plate is really special. Use your harvest to make healthy meals. Um, again, that's a really wonderful thing. You'll find your kids will try the stuff that they grow. It's, it's a phenomenon. If I gave them a random radish, they're not gonna eat it. But if they grow it, they're devouring it. So that's really wonderful to see and share with your neighbors. You know, you'd be surprised. You start a garden, your neighbors start to see you, you know, out there and growing things. They start asking questions and they start saying, well, can I try this? Or, you know, maybe I can do this. Or maybe this person has a lemon tree. So you bring them tomatoes and now they're sharing lemons. And, you know, on the weekends, we make a ceviche because the whole block has everything that we need to create this beautiful dish. So you know, it's a really great way to build community as well. Um, and yeah, it's just, it's something that I hope comes back to an elevated position because I know that especially in black and brown communities, it's seen as menial labor. In our histories, we have been the ones to toil the earth because the people with power did not want to do it. But they brought us here because we do it so well. They brought us here because in our legacies and in our ancestries, our people were masters of being in concert with the earth. And it was something that was revered. And I hope we get back to that. So this is a good place to start. If you guys have any questions, I'll leave time for that. I have a couple of things in the um, chat that I'm gonna read. I started my garden due to the pandemic and my son asked me to grow plants to give out, but I went crazy planting veggies, which is great. If you have the space and the time to try things out and do things, that's I, I'm really happy you did that. We use our veggies for cooking class. My neighbor and I share from our garden. So Miss Tracy, you are already, you, you on it. And that's really <laughs> wonderful to see. And I hope in the future you get to share what you learn and what you do with the people around you and the people here at the Wooten Center. Um, so thank you for sharing your experiences with that. Do we have any other questions? Something. Go, yes. I, I, mean, I just want to say a number of parents did uh, write in the chat. And because of time, maybe everybody can scroll back up and see why they're here. I really like um, what Ms. Thomas had to say about her experience here. I wanted to read your bio, which I didn't get to at first. Do you mind? Okay. I just want to take a few minutes. Okay. So she is Nicole Steele. A lot of parents came in after the beginning, uh, health equity programs manager. And of course, this was the basics of gardening. So as a transplant from Baltimore to Inglewood uh, with a small child and no car, I guess your name used to be Carter, mm -hmm. was, was forced to walk several miles to the nearest grocery store. She has uh, observed many vacant lots along her walk and began to grow increasingly frustrated. She could imagine Inglewood coming alive with a fresh local food system, uh, not content to sit idly by. Carter began 
petitioning local politicians and began designing the 100 Seeds of Change Initiative. A certified master gardener from UCLA, she manages, uh, ooh, this is on my phone, this is very little, uh, all SJLI, which is the social justice, what is the L for? Learning Institute. There you go. And nutrition programs. So she, look at, I, well, you can't see this, but these, um, I guess they're collars. Oh, no, they're kale, black kale. They are awesome. Huge. Please, sure. bigger than your head. So if you have questions, please um, form them now and, and ask them now. But Miss Naomi and Miss Christelle wanted me to remind you guys to please RSVP for uh, the next week's um, Parent Power Group. And um, I don't know if you have, you'll, you'll hear more about it, but there's another great uh, um, uh, session coming up. And I thought Miss Nicole, she came in here, she just loaded a PowerPoint and she went through, I, my husband gardens a lot, but I'm not into it. So I'm now, I want to get out there and make some. I started last year in an egg carton and everything died because he was watering and I told him, no, I wanted to water. And we were both watering, so we killed the plants. <laughs> so I just wanted you guys to uh, get some questions together. And uh, while you were writing and you said you wanted to write some things in the chat. I was going back and reading the chat. Um, oh, good. You saw some saying. There's not any questions. I see Ms. Tr Trina was saying she was inspired to start a garden by completing a community garden project for an internship program in Canada. That's really wonderful. So I wonder what gardening practices you learned up there that you can you know, share with people down here. That's really dope. Um, that's really cool. Um, and yeah, what like you were saying, Ms. Isidra, sometimes things die. It's kind of just, it's part of the process. And it can be a sad part of the process. And it's part of the process. Sometimes, you know, we have to level with ourselves about it and level with our children about it. But we can have, find solace in knowing that those things go right back into the soil to help regenerate for the next, you know, crop of goodness that we're going to need. Um, so don't get discouraged. Things happen sometimes. We had a year, was it two years ago, where the weather was so all over the place, my whole garden just, the plants didn't know what to do. And mm. oftentimes that can be out of our control because we've got climate change happening. And so the things are changing around here. Um, but, you know, we adjust, we, we, we pivot and that's part of the process too. So I hope that's not discouraging to anybody. But I was sad when those plants died. They were my babies. Yeah. And, uh, so, but I'm, I'm gonna try again. I'm, is it too late for this season? It's never too late out here. Go on for it. <laughs> Go for it. I hope that soon we can be in person. I would love to have you all out to one of our community gardens one day, or if there's a space at the Wooten Center for like a small garden, um, or if there's not one already there or at someone's home, maybe we could get together and do some things. I'd always be open to that because it was a pleasure being with you all today. Uh, my my biggest garden is in Inglewood here. It's over by the Forum. It's called Queen Park Community Garden. It's been shuttered for a while because of the pandemic, but we are re it's, it's always open, but I haven't been able to gather volunteers. But we are reopening. I just got a grant for an irrigation system, so that's going to be really helpful to me. Um, so I'm going to actually put the Instagram handle in the chat. And if you're on Instagram, you can follow there and see what we're up to. Okay. And while she's doing that, but you know in the uh, chat, for those of you who don't know, right next to uh, file, there's three dots. Click that, save the chat, or you can control A and, and get it all. But um, that's a really easy way for you to have it on your desktop or wherever it's gonna send it um, after we leave. She, she gave a lot of good information. So I'm impressed. Anybody else have any more questions? I would love to have you, Miss Brenda. I'm going to put my email address in the chat as well. Okay. And if you are ever interested in volunteering, because we do food giveaways on a weekly basis, we do, you know, bigger events and just things that where we pour into our community to make sure we have access to healthy food. Um, just shoot me an email. Say, hey, I want to volunteer. I send out a weekly, like, digest of upcoming opportunities, and the garden will be on there soon once we reopen. And then you can just say, hey, I want to come to this one, and we'll be happy to have you. Okay, last, last chance for questions. 
we are at the top of the hour. Don't forget to go. I think, Ms. Lizette, do you know the address where they would RSVP for next week's um, pa parent power group? Ms. Lizette, no, she must be on uh, mute. Okay. Uh, it's on. I went to the website. Okay, so wootencenter.org. And then, and then you go to events. Okay. okay. Events, and then it should say right there. You check your um, email because Ms. Christelle will send the flyer for the next one, or for all of them for this month. Yeah, Nicole, I will send her the email too. Ms. Nicole, if, if we do what you do, will we look as young as you? Uh -huh. High school age kids? <laughs> Y'all look good to me. I love it. <laughs> okay. You guys, uh, last questions. You put it in the chat. I'll leave it open for a few seconds. And um, thank you all for coming. This is a wonderful group. Thank you, Miss Brenda, Miss Alberta, Miss uh, ooh, Nurse. You know, it's funny. I tutor her son, but I never get the name, her name. So I'm going to say it like I read it. Nurshia, Lorena, Peters, and all of you for Miss Thomas. All of you for coming out and tell your kids hello. We miss them, but we're about to go back. We had our first meeting today for the summer camp. All right, you guys, thanks very much. Bye. 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 Don't forget to sign into the chat if you haven't already that you were here. All right, take care. Bye. Next week, Miss Christelle will be back. Okay, so how do we do this? Okay, good. So, Miss Lizette, I will talk to you again soon. Okay. All right. And, Miss Thomas, thank you.